the life and legacy of General George Patton. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. The first casualty in war is truth. My history teacher in Rhodesia, Mr. Reese Davies, who's also a member of Parliament, remind us, beware the victor's version. George Orwell, who wrote 1984, which was a school textbook of ours, wrote, in a time of universal deceit, telling the truth becomes a revolutionary act. Well, that's what we're busy with these days, revolution. And General George Patton was one of the most extraordinary, colourful, controversial characters of the 20th century. And so, for Henry Morton Stanley School of Christian Journalism to get the news behind the news, the unpublished news, particularly on the assassination of General George Patton, why was General Patton assassinated by his own government after he had been the most combat decorated successful general in America's history? And so understanding his life, his legacy, and his assassination and his message is super important. The first American home I stayed in was that of General Ben Parton. General Ben Parton is a super genius scientist who designed everything from cruise missiles, lasers. Uh, he, in fact, gave the name for laser, light amplified stimulated emission radiation, laser. And uh, you ask most people, where does the term la laser come from and what it stands for? I've met hordes of scientists who can't even tell you what laser stands for, but I met the scientist who designed laser. So General Ben Parton, I stayed in his home more than any other home in America, and his was the first home I stayed in back in 1988, my first visit to America. He took me around to a whole lot of places in Washington, D.C., to congressmen and senators, and met people like General, uh, all kinds of generals, but also Captain Red McDaniels, uh, Captain Red McDaniels, author of Scars and Stripes, head of the Prisoner of War Missing in Action um, organization in America. He spent six years being tortured by the communists in Hanoi uh, as a prisoner of war during the Vietnam War. And Red McDaniels had a whole lot of interesting things to tell one too. That's another story. But it was from General Parton that I first heard that America's most famous general of the Second World War, General George Patton, was assassinated by his own government. An extraordinary thing to find this out from an American who was head of American weapons programs and who designed many of their weapons, such as precision guarded weapons, cruise missiles, Puff the Magic Dragon, a whole lot more. General George S. Patton, Jr., well, he was born on the 11th of November, very interesting for any soldier to be born on the 11th of November, 1885. His homeschooling concentrated in classical literature. He was brought up in a privileged home. Now, his family had lost most of their fortune and everything because they were on the Confederate side in the war between the states, but they had managed to rebuild despite having lost everything during the war. In 1903, Patton went to Virginia Military Academy. I've been to VM, uh, the um, Virginia Military Academy, and it's an interesting place. Uh, still got the old traditions and a very serious school. Stonewall Jackson studied here. Stonewall Jackson lectured here as well. So Virginia Military Institute cannons in front of, or the VMI, in front of the barracks. He was later admitted to the United States Military Academy at West Point, entering in 1904. And West Point's Cadet Chapel completed in 1910 in the Gothic Revival style during an expansion of the Academy. The great structure the sanctuary window is inscribed to the motto of the academy, duty on a country. And one of the most famous speeches of General MacArthur, you'll recall, was duty on a country. Well, that comes straight from West Point Chapel Bay Windows. And here is the academy at West Point. Something like a castle. West Point barracks. And the uniforms haven't changed much in the last hundred and something years. Apart from his athletic achievements, he was a member of the riding, fencing, rifle, and track teams. In 1909, he was commissioned second lieutenant in the 15th Cavalry Regiment. Uh, here's this class picture. You don't see him smiling much. His wedding photo. He represented America in the Olympics in 1912 in Stockholm. 
he represented the United States in pentathlon in Stockholm, Sweden. Here is Patton running in the games, doing the uh, hurdles and fencing. That's right, that's General Patton. Well, at that stage, he would have been actually a lieutenant uh, in the modern pentathlon of the 1912 Olympics. So the pentathlon has five classic military skills, horse riding, running, swimming, marksmanship and fencing. The five main skills you need to be a good cavalry officer in particular. In fencing, he came first, in riding third, and he rated overall fifth out of the 43 international contestants. He should have won, but the judges judged that he had missed four shots, totally missed the, the target in shooting, and later on it was found actually all his bullets were there, but there were one on top of the other. They, they couldn't believe he could shoot that well. Uh, that there was no sign of anything except just one hole in the target, but later they found actually all the bullets were there. <coughs> but by then, they'd already announced the winners and, and so on. But he was the kind of person who didn't make a scene about it. Um, otherwise, he would have won, except for the fact that he was such a good shot, they didn't believe anyone could get all their targets in exactly the same hole. After touring Europe, he returned to the United States as a weapons instructor at the cavalry school. <coughs> and at this point, he designed a new saber, which was actually adopted for service. This is the cavalry saber, <coughs> 1913, also known as the Patton saber. <coughs> On his horse, Wiltex, in 1914. In 1916, he was posted to Texas and took part in the Mexican War as an aide de camp to General Perishing. It was at this time that Patton began to wear two revolvers on his belt, sort of like a cowboy. And uh, this is one of the Patton ivory handled uh, Colt revolvers that he is famous for. They were busy trying to track down Mexican revolutionary Pancho Villa who came across the border. Now interesting, he had had a good relationship with Americans, he was with General Perishing a few years earlier. and. Uh, for some reason, Pancho Villa decided to raid New Mexico and this started the Pancho Villa expedition or the Mexican War. And uh, he was the target. So, General Perishing and uh, Patton is on uh, the right of him. General Perishing's headquarters in Galeana in Mexico. Notice these cars, sort of the first mobile type of warfare using vehicles. And on the 14th of May, 1916, Patton encountered three mounted bandits and shot two of them dead. He returned to HQ with their bodies draped across the bonnet of his car, but ostentatious. One of the dead bandits turned out to be General Cardenas, who is the chief of the bodyguard of Pancho Villa. And Pancho Villa and a whole lot of his other leaders were um, wanted for a $5,000 reward. This is how America used to clean up the Wild West and anything else that just put prices on the heads of people and free enterprise got uh, rid of all the criminals. I think if you want to get rid of uh, ivory poachers or rhino poachers, put a price on the head. I mean, there's a lot of mercenary types who would gladly earn a living chasing down and it would be a lot cheaper tracking down criminals when you source it out to private hands, basically. In May 1917, Patton sailed to France in command of Perishing's headquarters detachment. But he didn't want to spend the war in HQ. He requested a transfer to a combat post. And he is assigned by Perishing to establish the Tank Corps. Tanks had only been invented the year before, 1916, the British Mark IV. When Patton accepted this posting, he didn't join the Tank Corps. There was no Tank Corps. He was the Tank Corps. They didn't have any tanks at the time. So it was Lieutenant Patton who obtained, acquired, the first two man Reynolds tanks from the French and he learned how to operate them and he trained other Americans in this new martial art. There's no training in this. He's a cavalry officer. And the logistical complications of war in France was huge. Now he's a major. He managed to field 144 Reynolds tanks that they'd obtained from the French in the Battle of Saint Mayel, September 1918. Now it just so happened they've made a big thing about what a spectacular, wonderful, genius battle was, but actually they were either very lucky or they had good intelligence because the German front line was what you call a salient and a salient is hard to hold because 
you need a lot of men to hold a salient and you can be fired at from three directions. So what you often do with a salient is you withdraw, you consolidate your lines to a more defendable position, either heights or river or something like that. So the German Group C was withdrawing from this area at the very moment that the American forces attacked and caught them on the move out of their trenches, uh, busy with a strategic withdrawal. And so this uh, spectacular advance made was actually, uh, well, they were making an advance anyway to consolidate the lines because in the advance, this group had advanced too far. And when you find yourself in a salient, which is exactly what South Africans were at the Battle of Delville Wood in the First World War, and why our people got absolutely slaughtered because they were in a salient. The French on the one side and the British on the other didn't do their part. And so the South Africans were... It's like fire and movement when you're the only one who goes forward and everyone else stays behind and you're exposed. Well, that's what happened here to German Group C. And so they were withdrawing anyway when the Americans attacked. And so sometimes some Americans, ignoring the context, make it out to be some spectacular achievement that they managed to uh, take so much territory when, for example, the Battle of the Somme, the British lost 650,000 men to gain four miles which they lost shortly afterwards anyway. Uh, so that was pretty standard in trench warfare. You could take the first trench, but then what? You've advanced over barbed wire chaos. You've bombarded the place to pieces. How is your resupply going to come? There's no roads. You've just obliterated everything. Now you're in a forward trench. Well, they've got three or four more trenches behind that, and they've got supply lines. So uh, trench warfare was not very usable, but at this particular point, the German lines had advanced and now they were just moving back in order to reconcile. So at any rate, it just fits into the propaganda very nicely afterwards. And here's some of this um, new tank corps, Reynolds FT-17 tanks, uh, in this battle in the Argonne. And so uh, this involved an American expeditionary force of 48,000 and French troops also under the uh, command of General Perishing. And... Uh, that was their first serious battle in the First World War. General Patton, well, Denier's major, was wounded in action because he charged, bayonet charged when he'd run out of ammunition and uh, obviously got shot. Um, hospitalized for the last days of the war, very frustrated that he hadn't managed to see more action in this First World War. Made a colonel uh, afterwards back at Camp Mead. Between the war years, General Patton continued to pioneer tank warfare in the U.S. Army. Next to nobody really believed the tank warfare was usable. In fact, there were generals of the Army saying that anyone who advocated the abolition of cavalry and its replacement with uh, armor uh, were traitors, uh, you know, literally guilty of treason if you're suggesting that the cavalry could be replaced by tanks. Well, he was one. He was a serious cavalry officer. He always wore his riding boots all the way to the end of his days, but uh, uh, he had recognized that uh, we've now got to swap our horse for an iron horse. And he designed the uniforms, and uh, when he, uh, just to see the kind of specifications to Smith & Weston in Springfield, Massachusetts, for his Smith & Weston 357 Magnum revolver, very specific requirements of what he wanted. And um, you can just tell the kind of person he was at that stage, this is 1935, ordering some special pistols. And here are just some examples of the kind of pistols that he ordered, obtained uh, with um, walnut uh, grips, which later were converted to ivory grips. And these are some George S. Patton GSP um, engraved revolvers, which he carried with him at all times. General Patton thought so highly of Field Marshal Erwin Rommel that he kept a copy of Rommel's book, Infantry Tactics, near his bedside for nighttime reading. He had read Rommel daily. And so to him, this was the ultimate gold standard in uh, mobile warfare. One of the quotes from General Rommel, sweat saves blood. In other words, training saves lives. Blood saves lives. In other words, sacrifice in warfare can save lives and brains can save both. General George S. Patton was recognized as the most ferocious general on the Allied side. They had no one else to compare with him. 
Known as the man who never lost a battle, the hero of North Africa and of Sicily, Patton was temporarily relieved of command for slapping two uninjured privates convalescing in military hospitals. He distinguished himself in North Africa. At first he was given a, a minor posting, but after the first battle of the U.S. forces in North Africa, they got slaughtered by Africa Corps, Kessering Pass, uh, absolute disaster, and uh, their general in charge of this fled, and the uh, field was left in disarray, and it was absolute chaos. So at this point, Eisenhower reluctantly brought up the one serious aggressive man who they all feared, but they thought in this situation, who else is going to take on Rommel? And so along came Patton, and Patton was disappointed they didn't get a chance to fight against Rommel because Rommel was sick and was back convalescing in Europe at the time when he managed to uh, take the field in Tunisia. But after distinguishing himself in North Africa, he engaged in a contest against his arch-rival, British General Bernard Law Montgomery, under whom my father served in the 8th Army. Patton and Montgomery on each sides with, uh, like the referee in the middle, Omar Bradley, um, Montgomery and Patton detested one another. And they were fighting the war more against one another than against anyone else on the other side, it would seem. Uh, and it, in fact, as somebody said, you had two prima donnas uh, fighting over who was going to get the news headlines, basically. And uh, this kind of smiling handshake is totally for the press. Uh, there was no love lost between these men at all. It just shows a picture can lie and give you the wrong impression. And so the first big serious opportunity for him to show what he is worth was going into Sicily. Now Sicily, he knew the history, he knew how to fight in Sicily, he knew everything from before the Crusaders and the Muslims and how the Normans freed Sicily from the Turks and all the rest of it. So he wanted to take the charge and instead Eisenhower put him in support and Montgomery was in the front and he was just to guard the flanks. Well, he wouldn't have that, so he basically raced through Sicily uh, at reckless speed and uh, made it into Messina before Montgomery. And uh, there's this classic uh, scene in the Patton film, which, which actually did happen, uh, where the British forces made it to Messina only to be welcomed by, Mon by Patton and the American Sixth Army. Uh, absolute one-upmanship take him to the nth degree. He pushed his men to the limit because he wanted to prove that the American fighting man was every bit as good as the British and even better. And so visiting a field hospital in the crags of Sicily's central highlands, he went from stretcher to stretcher, encouraging the wounded soldiers being treated. He then encountered a private Charles Cool, who was sitting, apparently uninjured, on a stool. Why are you here? the general demanded. I guess I can't take it, sir. The general was furious. You coward. Leave this tent at once. And as Cool remained motionless, the general slapped him hard across the face with his gloves. He then lifted the man off the stool by his collar of his uniform, shoved him to exit and kicked him in the rear and said, you hear me, you yellow bastard, you're going back to the front. In his journal that day, Patton wrote, if men shirk their duty, they should be tried for cowardice and shot. Now bear in mind, he's born in the 19th century, He's old school, he's been through the First World War, he's not impressed with this sort of thing, and as far as he's concerned, the generation they had running around uh, in the 1940s were a bunch of weaklings and wimps, and they didn't have real standards. So this is standard pattern attitude. Two days later, he wrote a memo to each of his commanders ordering them not to allow men suffering from so-called combat fatigue or battle fatigue or shell shock to receive medical care. People didn't understand this condition, in the First World War, it was called shell shock. In the Second World War, they called it battle fatigue. And it basically is, at a certain point, everyone, even the most experienced and courageous person, can just reach a limit. And you bombard a person hard enough. But on this occasion, this isn't someone who sat in the trenches being bombarded in the Battle of the Somme for four months. Um, it was something less than that. But whatever it was, General Patton didn't believe there was such a thing as post-traumatic stress syndrome. They didn't even know the term back then. Uh, they just knew the term shell shock and battle fatigue, and he's of that, that era that regard that as just an excuse for cowardice. Such men are cowards and bring disgrace to their comrades whom they heartlessly leave to endure the dangers of battle while they themselves use the hospital as a means of escape. You will see that...
such case are sent, not sent to the hospital. So here's his memo, and uh, he wants them, if they're not willing to fight, they must be tried by court martial Kaudas in the face of the enemy, which only had one sentence. On the 10th of August 1943, Patton encountered a 21-year-old private Paul Bennett, who was shaking from convulsions and in tears, but apparently uninjured, in the hospital. It's my nerve, sir. I can't stand the shelling anymore, he says. Patton roared, your nerve's hell. You're just a goddamn coward. And as Bennett began sobbing, the general slapped him. Shut up. I won't have these brave men here who've been shot see a yellow bastard sitting here crying. And as he hit him again, Bennett's helmet fell to the floor. You're a disgrace to the army. You're going to go back to the front to fight. You ought to be lined up against a worn shot. In fact, I ought to shoot you right now. And he pulled out with his right hand his ivory-handled revolver from his holster. And he backhanded Bennett across the face. And the medical staff rushed in to intervene and ushered the private out the tent for his own safety because they really feared that he might shoot him there and then in the tent. Sadly, there were journalists around. When word reached General Eisenhower, he wrote a stern rebuke to General Patton, who personally apologized to both soldiers and to medical staff who had witnessed his actions. You would think that would be the end of it. I mean, they're fighting a war. A media campaign in the USA led to such public outrage that the American Congress, you would have thought had something more important to do, called for Patton's immediate dismissal. Now, he's the only American general who's won any battles at all at this stage. Despite his tremendous achievements in the battlefield, they wanted him court-martialed, kicked out, fired, whatever they could do. And here's his first character, Private Cool, who was slapped by Patton, who made himself rich on relating the story and being a victim, and he is treated like a media hero by the press back in America. So Patton wrote in his journal, It's sad and shocking to think that victory and the lives of thousands of men are pawns to the writings of a group of unprincipled reporters and weak-kneed congressmen. But so it is. And so it often is. That's true in missions. It's true in almost anything. Distraction. Some, here you're dealing with major events where not just thousands, but tens of thousands of people are dying. And then somehow the media ignores all that and they focus on he hurt someone's feelings, called him some bad words, and slapped this man. Now, in a military code, slapping a subordinate is a court-martial offense. An officer's meant to have high standards in that. So he, he, he broke a military rule, and he could definitely be disciplined for it. But in the scheme of things, it wasn't that serious. General Dwight Eisenhower ordered the four million Allied soldiers in Germany to halt on, oh, wow, we've jumped ahead to the wrong thing. General Patton was seized with fury and said, some of these are just damn fools have no idea of Russian history. I doubt that they knew that Russia just over a hundred years ago owned Finland, sucked the blood out of Poland, were using Siberia as a prison for their own people, how Stalin must have sneered when he got through them at all those phony conferences. Letting the Russians take Berlin is folly, he said. We should push on as far east as possible. We shouldn't stop before Moscow. The Soviets maintained a stranglehold on Eastern Europe for 45 years. Millions of civilian refugees fleeing towards American lines were turned back at bayonet point. Millions ended up as slave labor in Soviet concentration camps. American President Franklin Delano Roosevelt turned to one of his classmates from Columbia Law School, Wild Bill Donovan, to establish the Office of Strategic Services, OSS, which became the precursor to the CIA, Central Intelligence Organization, Wild Bill Donovan, hardcore communist. The OSS did the dirty work of assassinations on Franklin Delano Roosevelt's instructions. Donovan ensured that Tito's communist partisans waging guerrilla warfare in Yugoslavia received lavish quantities of American tanks, trucks, jeeps, hundreds of tons of armaments and ammunition, landmines, heavy machine guns, he would not support the Christian forces and the royalist forces. They supported only the communist forces. Here's Marshal Tito on the right, the communist Red Army leader in Yugoslavia who got all of America's support thanks to Wild Bill Donovan and the OSS. Here's an OSS agent standing in the center with other 
with partisans they were supporting in Yugoslavia, 1944. This undercover battle led by Donovan and the OSS ensured that Eastern Europe fell into the hands of the Soviet Union. General Walter Bedell Smith wrote to Winston Churchill that Wild Bill Donovan was out of control with a predilection for political intrigue. Donovan only reported to the President of the United States. He didn't even have to report to the Joint Chiefs of Staff. No military accountability, just answered to the Politico up top. The OSS were basically a terrorist organization. They did assassinations, landmines, bombings, all the sort of things you'd think of in our days the communists do. But then again, they were run by communists. And their tactics were very much following that of communists, although these are the propaganda pictures, codes, radios, that sort of thing. Here they're dressed in uniforms, but of course they didn't operate in uniforms in Europe. And they trained terrorists, like the PLA of the uh, Red Chinese of Mao Zedong, OSS insignia. Well, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, before the end of his life, authorized Donovan to set up the Central Intelligence Organization. He set up basically the foundations in which the CIA was built. Donovan had no moral, ethical qualms about dealing with communists. He channeled millions of dollars of taxpayers' money to Chinese communists of Mao Zedong to fight against America's official ally, nationalist China, under General Chiang Kai-shek, who was a Christian. And so in China, they ensured that the communists won. They channeled all aid to them. And in fact, as Truman even boasted, uh, that he has disarmed uh, Chiang Kai-shek's 16 divisions by redirecting the weapons that Congress had ordered be sent to Chinese nationalists to go to the Chinese communists. So Donovan operated a secret slush fund provided by Congress and its War Agencies Appropriation Act. Donovan spent it any way he liked without any regard to oversight or legality, no books, no records, no accountability. The money was meant to cover far-flung spy and sabotage operations throughout Europe and Asia, and under the authority of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Wild Bill ordered many, many thousands of political assassinations. On the 17th of April, General Patton's single-engined L5 Sentinel propeller plane was attacked head-on by a Spitfire bearing British Royal Air Force markings. Despite Patton's L5 being an unarmed American staff plane with American markings, the Spitfire fired its whole nine yards, traces flying past the sides of Patton's aircraft as his pilot took evasive action. It's a good thing General Patton's pilot was a very experienced combat pilot, and if he hadn't been, Patton would have been history then. During the maneuvers, the British fighter plane crashed on the ground. The general was nagged by a question, was the Spitfire attack an accident or was it a deliberate assassination attempt? Why would a Spitfire attack an American plane? Well, it wasn't just the one plane. There was a whole flight of Spitfires above observing this attack. One went down and an attack. Now, could it have been Spit? It was in British markings, but of course... The British had given thousands of Spitfires to the Soviets under Lend-Lease. And so it could have been a Soviet one that had British markings specifically for this assassination attempt. That's one theory. It could be Polish. Polish were also flying in Spitfires, but why would the Poles want to kill him? If the British did it, who authorized it? It was a very strange attack. Patton wrote, let's keep our boots polished, our bayonets sharpened, and present a picture of force and strength to the Soviets. This is the only language they understand and respect. If you fail to do this, then I would say to you that you've lost the war. Even British Field Marshal Montgomery agreed with Patton's assessment, ordered his troops to stack Wehrmacht rifles in such a way they could be easily redistributed amongst the prisons of war, should the British and Germans need to defend themselves against a Soviet attack. Army intelligence warned General Patton that his life was in danger from the NKVD. The Cheka, the Soviet secret police, had become the NKVD. It later became after the war the KGB. Marshal Stalin had ordered General Patton to be assassinated. General Patton opposed the official American policy of forcing millions of former German soldiers to be sent as slave labor to Russia. These men should be used to rebuild their own country, he said. The entire country had been bombed into rubble. To see German soldiers prisons of war, treated with such contempt and in breach of the Geneva Convention, the Hague Rules of Warfare, 
Here the Germans had treated the Allied prisoners well. I've spoken to South Africans who were captured at Trabuk and spent three years in German prison camps and said they never mistreated once. said we were hungry sometimes, but the prison guards were just as hungry. Everyone was starving in Europe at the end of the war. And, uh, and there was no taking away of the watches and so on, but the first thing the Allies would do when they took a German prisoner, take away his watch, take away his medals, take away all his private things. This is just nothing but thievery. But to kick and abuse people who've been disarmed is really low. The roads, the bridges, the plumbing systems all need to be rebuilt. 63 cities in Germany had been bombed into rubble. Multiplied millions of people with, without any homes. The Germans are the only decent people left in Europe, said Patton. It's a choice between them and the Russians, and I prefer the Germans, he insisted. General Robert E. Lee said any army who wages war against defenseless civilians, no matter what its excuse, is no army but barbarians unworthy of the name Christian. Now, he's talking about General Sherman's march through Georgia and the Yankees, but it would have applied to the U.S. Army and Air Force in 1945 too. General Marshall ordered that Patton's phones be tapped and requested a psychoanalyst from Navy's medical corps to observe General Patton. Eisenhower wrote scathingly of Patton regarding him as a loose cannon because he distrusted the Soviets. Why would you distrust the Soviets? You've just butchered something like 60 million of their own people. While Bill Donovan, who traveled in and out of Moscow and had direct access to Marshal Stalin, loathed Patton. While Bill Donovan is apparently the only person who had direct access to Stalin at any time. Stalin's own Politburo didn't dare walk in unrequested and unsummoned. While Bill Donovan could go in Moscow or down to Dhaka in Crimea, he could walk straight in without an appointment, knock on a door and walk right in and see Marshal Stalin in his office or in his bedroom. No problem. While Bill Donovan, head of the American Secret Service, was a personal friend of Marshal Stalin. The OSS and NKVD exchanged information, helping one another in espionage projects, including spying on General Patton. OSS agent Duncan Lee was assigned to spy on General Patton when he was military governor of the U.S. occupation zone in southern Germany. He provided regular reports on Patton's movements and recordings of wiretaps on his phone and office. Duncan Chaplin Lee was a confidential assistant to Major General William Donovan, second in command of the founder of the OSS. Duncan Lee was a double agent. He also worked for the Soviet spy agency, the NKVD. Now, did Donovan know this? Probably. Duncan Lee had provided the Soviets with advance warning of D-Day landings, date and exact location of the atomic bomb research in the USA, and much more. Here, Duncan Lee was testifying before the House Un-American Activities. Um, this is in the U.S. under uh, the House American, Un-American Activities, exposing the communists within the American government. Uh, this lady here, Miss Elizabeth Bentley, was a communist agent who came out and identified other communist agents, including Duncan Lee sitting behind her there. This is the one who was put in Patton's office in order to spy on him, who is second command of the OSS. So she is a former Red agent. And uh, here's a book on the life of Duncan Lee, Red Spy and Cold War Warrior. His ID card from his stint aiding Chinese communists, notice lawyer. A lot of communists use lawyer as the cover. Then there was Stepan Bandera, a Ukrainian nationalist leader. On the 16th of May 1945, remember the Ukrainians were allied with the Germans fighting against the Russians, the Soviets, during the war. And so the Ukrainian army, in fact, was fighting in the field as late as 1955 against the Red Army. Stefan Bandera defected the Americans and formed Stefan Stubik of the U.S. Army Counterintelligence Corps. The Soviet high command has been ordered by Marshal Stalin to kill U.S. Army General George Patton. Now, Bandera knew this. He had been um, high enough up to know what was going on there. Rather than being shocked at Skubik's news, Donovan ordered Bandera return to the Russians, thereby silencing the man who was warning about an attempt on General Patton's life. So Stefan Bandera, Ukrainian insurgent army uh, leader, was executed by order Stalin because Wild Bill Donovan ordered him to be handed back to the very communist he had been fighting. He is remembered in Ukraine as a national hero. 
uh, you can see one of the postage stamps on the 100th anniversary of his birth. Then there was Ukrainian diplomat Professor Roman Smalstocki, who said the NKVD will soon attempt to kill General George Patton. Stalin wants him dead. Professor Smalstocki was expelled by the Americans from Germany and betrayed and sent back to the NKVD in Russia to be executed. Here's Roman Smalstocki. Then there was Ukrainian General Pavlo Shundruk. He informed the same special agent Skubik that he had vital intelligence. Please tell General Patton to be on guard. He is at the top of the NKVD list to be killed. The Americans also betrayed General Shundruk into the hands of the NKVD to be killed. Another top Ukrainian leader. In Berlin, Patton learned that there were more than 20 thousand American prisoners of war who had been captured by the Germans and were being held in German areas that had been overrun by the Red Army. They fell into Russian hands at the end of the war and they were being used as leverage in negotiations with the Allies. To ensure that the three million Russians, Ukrainians and other East Europeans and Western Europe be forced across the border into Soviet hands, there were two million Russians, another million Ukrainians and other East Europeans who were in the West, who were forced by Operation Kielhaw under the Yalta Agreement to be sent back to the Soviets. Some of them had fought as volunteers for the Germans in the Ukrainian army, in the Russian Free Army, uh, in the Baltic forces to oppose the Soviets. But many were women and children, many were never lived in Russia, many had been born in Europe, their family had fled Russia since the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917. Women and children were forced across the rivers into the hands of the NKVD where they were either slaughtered or sent to slave labor camps in Siberia. The Russians denied the Americans and British access to the prison of war camps where their own men were being held. So British and American prisoners of war who had survived the war and were captured now by the Soviets, the Allies, wouldn't let them go back. And the Allied government suppressed this information that the men were being held hostage by the Allied Marshal Stalin. You can't let people get the right idea now that Stalin's not exactly a Democrat. Some of the many Russians captured during Operation Barbarossa, all three million Russians and Ukrainians and other East Europeans and Western Europe were betrayed in the hands of the Soviets who butchered them. There's terrible stories of Russian mothers throwing their babies into the icy rivers to drown rather than let them be brought up as atheists or be abused by the Soviets on the other side. What it must do to lead people to do something like that. And the Allies, Operation Kiel Hall, this was sealed for 20, no, 30 years, 30 years. It came out in 1975. And when the book came out, I remember this one book was entitled The Last Secret. <laughs> Hardly The Last Secret, there's still a whole lot more to come. Well, General Patton insulted Soviet Marshal Zhukov. Patton publicly stated the Soviets are the real enemy. The Germans have never been our enemy. They our natural allies, the Soviets are not our real allies, they are natural enemy. Patton became convinced that the only way he could speak freely about these issues was to retire from the military so that I can go home and say what I have to say. Patton saw his battlefield changing. He was still a warrior, but now the podium and the pen would be his main weapons to expose the treachery of the US government and the danger to the Soviets, of the Soviets, which are meant to be the allies. You've noticed in recent years since President Trump became president, there's a whole narrative in the media about there's Russian collusion and Trump's been talking to the Russians. Well, in fact, that's meant to be the job of any head of state to speak to other governments. The original Russian collusion was right here. Stalin with Franklin Delano Roosevelt, President of America, and Churchill of Britain. I mean, this is Russian collusion because they were sending them trillions of dollars worth of weapons and aid. With 18 divisions and more than half a million fighting men, the Third Army was the largest U.S. fighting force in history and certainly the most experienced, well-trained, super fit ever. Patton was convinced that he could have freed all of Eastern Europe if Eisenhower had not halted his supplies and fuel. Literally, stop order stopped him getting the fuel so that his tanks ran out. He actually liberated part of Czechoslovakia and was ordered to turn around and go back. The Red Army must take Czechoslovakia. 
At the end of the Second World War, America's top military leader, Combat General George Patton, accurately assessed the shift in the balance of world power which the war produced, and he foresaw the enormous danger of communist aggression against the West. Alone amongst the U.S. leaders, General George Patton warned that America should act immediately against the Soviet threat. Unfortunately, his warnings went unheeded, and he was quickly silenced by a convenient accident which took his life. His daughter saw that his papers were published in the 1970s, that published under the title The Patton Papers. Patton warned that America should act immediately, while his supremacy was unchallengeable to end that danger. And she's the only member of the nuclear club at that moment. In the terrible summer of 1945, the US Army had just completed the destruction of much of Germany. Carpet bombing, the British bomb by night, the Americans bomb by day. They destroyed cities, killed hundreds of thousands of people, many of them in their beds, destroyed the entire infrastructure, every bridge, every harbour, every railway had been destroyed. And here they even are cheerfully advertising how they're blasting uh, Bremen, which is a port city. And in here, in this newspaper broadcast, it actually speaks about the terror bombings of civilian populations as a strategic bombing campaign target. Dresden, filmed by the Allies, the British bombed at night, the Americans bombed by day. And they came in waves. The Allies set up a government of military occupation amidst the ruins to rule the starving Germans who had endured what no other people have ever endured in history. Such utter destruction from all sides, bombing of their cities and their homes and killing of their relatives, and then to deal out victor's justice to the vanquished. Never before in history had this been done, that you'd try people for being on the losing side. Now, General Patton was the military governor of effectively Bavaria, the greater portion of the American occupation zone of Germany, southern Germany. And it's only in the final days of the war and during his tenure as military governor of southern Germany that he got to know both the Germans and America's gallant Soviet allies. And his understanding of the true situation grew and his opinions dramatically changed. His diary and letters were published in 1974 under the title The Patton Papers. In his diary and in many letters to his family, friends, various military colleagues, government officials, he expressed his new understanding and his apprehension for the future. Several months before the end of the war, General Patton began to recognize the fearful danger at the West posed by the Soviet Union. He bitterly disagreed with the orders which had been given to hold back his army and wait for the Red Army to occupy a vast stretch of Germany, Czech, Romanian, Hungarian and Yugoslav territory, which the Americans could have easily taken. And by the way, the Soviets were only able to advance because of Allied fuel, Allied weapons, Allied tanks, Allied trucks, and everything else. Winston Churchill and FDR were funding the Soviets. In fact, Winston Churchill, who had once described the Bolsheviks as the greatest threat to civilization, a new plague bacillus, like the bubonic plague, um, and he had described the Bolsheviks as the greatest threats to civilization, to Christianity, to the West, to British Empire. But in 1935, when his finances were ruined from his gambling and all his drunkenness and so on, and he was about to lose his estate, in came forward some bankers who basically covered his debts. And from that point, suddenly, he didn't have another bad word to say about the Soviets. And for the rest of his life, he was very much on sides. Interesting what money can do. The Yalta Agreement, where they redrew the map of Europe, was absolutely disgraceful. Churchill, Stalin, FDR gave the whole of Eastern Europe and Central Europe, basically, to the Soviets. Look at this kind of propaganda poster. The Soviet flag next to the Australian, the Taiwanese, or nationalist Chinese, the American, British, there's Mexico's, Nor Norway's, Belgium. Brazil. Ours is somewhere around here. Oh, there's the Czech flag. <laughs> Little do they know they're about to be betrayed to the Soviets. And 150 million Christians of 10 countries betrayed behind the Iron Curtain at Yalta. President Truman was part of that too. 
On the 7th of May 1945, just before the German capitulation, Patton had a conference in Austria with the US Secretary of War, Robert Patterson. Patton was gravely concerned of the Soviet failure to respect demarcation lines separating the Soviet and American occupation zones. He was also alarmed by plans in Washington for the immediate demobilization of much of the US Army. Patton said, we've got to keep our boots polished, our bayonets sharpened, present a picture of force and strength to the Red Army. This is the only language to understand and, and respect. Patterson replied, oh, George, you've been so close to this thing so long, you've lost sight of the big picture. Patton replied, I understand the situation. There, the Soviet supply system is inadequate to maintain them in a serious action such as I could put to them. They have chickens in the coop and cattle on the hoof. That's their supply system. They could probably maintain themselves in a type of fighting I could give them for five days. After that, it would make no difference how many million men they had. And if you wanted Moscow, I could give it to you. They lived on the land coming down. There's insufficient left for them to maintain themselves going back. They've looted their way across Europe. What they can live on if we chase them back over it. Let's not give them time to build up their supplies. If we do not, then we have had a victory over the Germans and disarmed them, but we have failed in the liberation of Europe. We have lost the war. And the Iron Curtain is proof of that. Patton's urgent and prophetic advice went unheeded by Patterson and the other politicians and only served to give warning about Patton's feelings to the alien conspirators behind the scenes in New York, Washington and Moscow. The more he saw the Soviets, the stronger Patton's conviction grew that the proper course of action would be to stifle communism then and there while the chance existed. Late in May 1945, he attended several meetings and social affairs with top Red Army officials and he evaluated them carefully. He noted in his diary, I've never seen in any army at any time, including the German Imperial Army of 1912, as severe discipline as exists in the Russian army. The officers, with few exceptions, give the appearance of Mongolian bandits. Patton's aide, General Herbert Gay, noted in his own journal, everything the Russians did impressed on with the idea of cruelty. Nevertheless, Patton knew that the Americans could defeat the Reds then, but perhaps not later. On the 18th of May, Patton wrote in his diary, In my opinion, the American army as it now exists could beat the Russians with the greatest of ease because while the Russians have good infantry, they are lacking in artillery, air, tanks, and knowledge and use of the combined arms, whereas we excel in all three of these. If it should be necessary to fight the Russians, the sooner we do so, the better. Two days later, he repeated his concern when he wrote to his wife, If we have to fight them, now is the time. From now on, we will only get weaker and they will get stronger. I mean, the American army was at its peak, Navy, Air Force, everything, and they were there. Why stop now? If we are here to fight for freedom and democracy and to free Europe, then how can we allow them to take over so much of Europe? Having recognized the Soviet danger, Patton urged a course of action which would have freed all of Eastern Europe from the communist yoke with expenditure of less American blood than was spilled in Korea and Vietnam and would have obviated both those latter wars. If you'd have destroyed communism, well, of course, it would have been better if they just stood by and let Germany destroy the Soviet Union in Operation Barbarossa in 1941 without Lend-Lease and all the rest anyway. But okay, in 1945, recognizing mistakes made, what should we do now? Patton next came to evaluate the nature of the people for whom the Second World War was fought, the Jews. Most of the Jews swarming of Germany immediately after the war came from Poland and Russia, and Patton found their personal habit shockingly uncivilized. Here you can see the uh, treatment of prisoners of war at Dachau uh, over uh, what is often said to be camp guards, but they weren't camp guards. The camp guards had left, and a Waffen-SS, that's a military force, was called to basically hold the camp until uh, the Americans arrived and hand over to them. And so when the Americans arrived, not understanding these are not the prison camp guards, these are just military people who are drafted in for a job, they line them up against one and they just shot them in cold blood. This is one of the documented massacres done by the Allies. And they, they seem to think that this is all justified. And then they allowed the prisoners to start abusing others before they murdered them too. Patton was disgusted by their behavior in the camps of displaced persons, DPs which the Americans built for them, and he's even more disgusted by the way they behaved when they're housed in German hospitals and private homes. 
He observes with horror, these people do not understand toilets and refuse except to use them as repositories for tin cans, garbage and refuse. They decline where practical to use latrines, preferring to relieve themselves on the floor. He described in his diary one DP camp where, although room existed, the Jews were crowded together to an appalling extent. And practically every room there's a pile of garbage in one corner which was also used as a latrine. The Jews were only forced to desist from their nastiness and clean up their mess by the threat of the butt end of rifles. Of course, I know the expression lost tribes of Israel applied to the tribes which disappeared, not to the tribe of Judah from which the current SOBs are descended. However, it is my personal opinion that this too is a lost tribe, lost to all decency. Patton's initial impressions of the Jews were not improved when he attended Jewish religious service at Eisenhower's insistence. His diary entry for 17 September 1945 reads, This happened to be the Feast of Yom Kippur, so they were all collected in a large wooden building which they called a synagogue. It behooved General Eisenhower to make a speech to them. We entered the synagogue which was packed with the greatest stinking bunch of humanity I've ever seen. When we got up halfway, the head of rabbi, who was dressed in a fur hat similar to that worn by Henry VIII, and a surplus heavily embroidered, very filthy, came down and met the general. The smell was so terrible that I almost fainted. And actually, about three hours later, I lost my lunch as a result of remembering it. Now, these experiences, like a great many others, firmly convinced Patton that the Jews were an especially unsavory variety of people and hardly deserving of all the official concern that the American government was bestowing on them. Another September diary entry followed the demand from Washington that more German housing be turned over to Jews. Uh, here's the US Secretary of the Treasury, Henry Morgenthau, who had the Morgenthau Plan, which was basically to genocide Germany. Evidently, the virus started by Morgenthau and Barak of a Semitic revenge against Germans is still working. Harrison, the US State Department official and associates, indicate that they feel that German civilians should be removed from houses for the purpose of housing displaced persons. There are two errors in this judgment, he said. <coughs> First, when we remove an individual German, we punish that individual. Well, the punishment is not intended for the individual. <coughs> Furthermore, it is against my Anglo-Saxon conscience to remove a person from their house, which is a punishment without due process of law. He who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the just, both of them alike on abomination to the Lord. And yet you could have newspapers like these, kill the German, calling for killing all of them. Just look at how the French behaved. These are women who had dated or been girlfriends of Germans during the occupation. And so look at the vindictive mentality of people, cutting them, shaving them bald, treating them disgrace, stripping them of their clothes, treating them as subhumans just because they had been having a relationship with some of the occupiers during the war. Camp located between the American and Soviet zones was organized for refugees, political prisoners, POWs and displaced persons. Still quoting from Patton, in the second place Harrison is ill believed the displaced person is a decent human being, which he is not. And this particularly applies to those Jews whose behavior is lower than animals. You can see why General Patton got into trouble talking like that. One of the strongest factors influencing General Patton's thinking on the conquered Germans was the behavior of the American-controlled news media towards him. I mean, this is how the people of Sudetenland treated the Germans when they came in to liberate them. At a press conference in Regensburg, May the 8th, Immediately after Germany's surrender, Patton was asked whether he planned to treat captured SS troops differently from other German prisoners of war. His answer was no. SS means no more German than being a Democrat in America. There's no reason for trying someone who's drafted into this outfit. With great reluctance, only after repeated promptings from Eisenhower, he had thrown German families out of their homes to make room for more than a million German Jewish DPs, a million DPs. Part of the famous six million, he said, who've supposedly been gassed. You know, how come there's so many millions of survivors? What happened to German efficiency in 13 years and all that? But he bulked when ordered to begin blowing up German factories in accordance with the infamous Morgenthau plan to destroy Germany's economic basis forever. In his diary, he wrote it, I doubted the expediency of blowing up factories because the ends for which the factory had been blown up, that is, preventing Germany from preparing for war, 
which you would have thought the bombing campaigns done well enough, can be equally well attained through the destruction of their machinery, while the buildings can still be used to house thousands of homeless persons. You've got a shortage of homes, so why not just use the factories for homing people too? Similarly expressed doubts to his military colleagues about the overwhelming emphasis being placed on the persecution of every German who had formerly been a member of the National Socialist Party. In a letter to his wife, he wrote, I'm frankly opposed to this war criminal stuff. It's not cricket. It's Semitic. I'm opposed to sending prisoners of war to work as slaves in foreign lands like the Soviet gulags, where many will be starved to death. In fact, of the millions of German prisoners of war who were handed over to the Soviets, including those who surrendered in American British lands, millions were handed over, marched across the Soviets to use as slave labor. Very few ever survived. Very, very, very few returned. The vast majority died in the slave camps of Siberia. And German civilians who lived in places like Ukraine and the Baltic and so on were all deported. Millions lost their homes. German refugees from East Prussia fleeing the Red Army. You can just imagine the panic at the end of the war with the Red Army coming down on the people. And nearly half of these refugees died of cold, starvation and disease. Labor camps in the Soviet Union, Siberian concentration camps, Arctic hell holes. Temperatures could go from 40 degrees Celsius above down to 48 degrees below. I mean, virtually 100 degrees Celsius fluctuation from middle of summer to middle of winter. Using civilians like slaves. This is the Soviet Union, Siberian gulag archipelago hellholes which chewed up how many tens of millions of russian christian lives and then also was the ending for many german soldiers shipped off into these arctic hellholes and if you understand true evil just understand the massive death tolls which has been documented for example by, by Pref professor rummel's death by government as joseph Stalin said one death is a tragedy but the death of a million is just a statistic. Communism kills. According to the Black Book of Communism, at least 100 million killed in the Soviet Union as its satellites just between 1917 and 1991. To think an ideology that killed over 100 million people in the last century is praised in our universities today, including UCT. Displaced persons, people who'd lost everything, Refugees, of course, if you're a displaced person, but you weren't Jewish and you didn't matter. And people who had the homes destroyed had to just rebuild. People being starved, living off what was put in the dustbins. And can you imagine rebuilding your lives amidst such rubble and amidst such hatred? Despite his disagreement with official policy, General Patton did follow the rules laid down by Morgenthau and others back in Washington as closely as his conscience would allow, but not good enough for Eisenhower. He tried to moderate the effect and this brought him into increasing conflict with Eisenhower and the other politically ambitious generals. In another letter to his writing, he commented, I've been at Frankfurt for a civil government conference. If what we're doing to the Germans is liberty, then give me death. I can't see how Americans can sink so low. It's Semitic, and I'm sure of it. In his diary noted, today we received orders to which we are told to give the Jews special accommodations. If for Jews, why not Catholics and Mormons? We're turning over the to the French, several hundred thousand German prisoners of war to be used as slave labor in France. It's amusing to recall that we fought the revolution in defense of the rights of man and the civil war to abolish slavery. Now we've gone back on both principles. We're promoting slavery and the abolition of rights. It is an abomination for kings to commit wickedness, for a throne is established by righteousness. His duties as military governor took pattern to all parts of Germany and intimately acquainted them with the German people and their conditions. He couldn't help to compare them with the French, the Italians, the Belgians, and even the British. This comparison gradually forced him to the conclusion that the World War II had been fought against the wrong people. After a visit to Ruin Berlin, he wrote to his wife, and just for a moment, have a look at how Germany was before the war. The Unterlinden, the cars, the airships, the streets, the cafes in Berlin. This is the highest standard of living any people had ever achieved on earth. 
1933 to 1939, Germany really had such that the highest amount of holidays for workers, best roads, best everything. And it was the Olympics in 1936 in, in Berlin that when people saw how advanced Germany was and people saw their high standard of living, that it was understood. There's going to be a war and they're going to bomb it all. They can't let any of this remain because their own soldiers would revolt if they knew what standards they're able to have without having banks that are controlled by the Rothschilds, without paying interest, without the whole usury system. Uh, that Do you know that in Germany uh, in 1930s, you got a thousand mark loan when you got married, which was enough to get you a decent semi-detached house. And for every child born, you'd get 250 marks. That's a quarter of your, your housing debt abolished. So if you had four children, your house was owned by you, no debt, debt free. You just think about these sort of standards of living that they could have. But this is what Berlin looked like when Patton visited it. This, an entire city, the biggest pile of rubble on earth. And ruined lives. People who'd lost everything. Gruesome harvest. James Buck, a French Canadian journalist documented in Crimes and Mercies that 18 million Germans died after the war under Allied brutality, mostly in the Soviet Union zone, but also a million, 1.1 million German prisoners of war died in American prison camps in the months after the war was over. More German soldiers died in Allied prison camps than died in combat in the six years of the war. And you're not allowed to talk about this. But James Bach was the first journalist to break open the seal and speak about the fate of German civilians under Allied occupation 1944 to 1950, which is, this is a real Holocaust and genocide. Quoting from General Patton, Berlin gave me the blues. We have destroyed a good race and we're about to replace them with Mongolian savages and all Europe will be communist. It is said that for the first week after the Soviets took Berlin, all women who ran were shot and those who did not were raped. I could have taken Berlin instead of the Soviets had I been allowed. Germany, remember, had been allied with Hungary and Romania and Bulgaria and Italy and Croatia and Finland and all the Baltic states and the Ukraine and the Free Russians to fight for the freedom of Europe from communism. We often speak about the democracies against the dictatorships. But most of the allies of Germany were democracies, like Finland and Romania and Bulgaria and Croatia. And they were fighting, the main enemy they were fighting was communism, totalitarianism and Soviet Union. So this democracies against dictatorships is not actually a true narrative. It's a bit of a propaganda narrative. 2 Chronicles 19 verse 2, should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord, therefore the wrath of the Lord is upon you. To have aided the Soviet Union in enslaving half of Europe is indefensible. This conviction that the politicians had used him, General Patton, and the U.S. Army, including his Third Army, for a criminal purpose grew in the following weeks. During a dinner with the French General Alfonso Yon in August, Patton was surprised to find the Frenchman in agreement with him. Commander of the French Expeditionary Corps. His diary entry for August 18th quotes General Yon. It is indeed unfortunate, Mon General, that the English and Americans have destroyed in Europe the only sound country, and I do not mean France. Therefore, the road is now open for the advent of Russian communism. Indeed, Germany was the main obstacle to communism taking over Europe. Later diary entries and letters to his wife reiterate the same conclusion. Actually, the Germans are the only decent people left in Europe. It's a choice between them and the Russians. I prefer the Germans. In fact, the Germans were his kind of people. Tough, disciplined, classical, art, great warriors. In fact, his model for good tank warfare and kind to animals. What we are doing is to destroy the only modern state in Europe so the Russians can swallow the whole, he wrote. And so the Soviets were given huge chunks. Vast parts of this is now Russia or Poland. Germany's lost a huge amount of the territory. And Eisenhower at the heart of it. Eisenhower, by the way, is not a real soldier. Eisenhower was a clock. In fact, as General MacArthur was once asked when Eisenhower was running for president, he said, what do you think? Do you think he'll make a good president? General MacArthur said, 
I think he'll make a fine president. He's the best clerk I ever had. And Eisenhower was a nothing nobody. A major when the Americans entered the war. And his, he was at a cocktail party in Washington, D.C. And Franklin Delano Roosevelt's daughter was having a chat to him. And she said, just a minute, you've got to meet my dad. And she walked into Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the president's office, and said, Dad, I found a man to run your war in Europe. And you get these details in the book, The Politician, which is about Eisenhower, who's often people think of as a military leader. He wasn't a military leader, he was a politician. He never heard a shot fired in anger. He is never in a battle. He was a politician chosen and just taken from major up to four-star general, five-star general, in charge of the whole Allied forces, put dropped in there, and he wasn't a real soldier. And Patton knew that, and Patton despised him, obviously. Here they are at, uh, I mean, even here, just look at uh, Truman, Eisenhower, and there's Patton. Uh, spot the real soldier and the politicians. Well, Berlin was divided into political sectors. Nuremberg courtroom, they put on trial German leaders, including civilians, and hung many of them. This is where German officers were put in offices. This is a prison camp where they have no roofs, no access to showers, bathrooms, plumbing, anything like this. And they've got no privacy. And you can see the machine gun tower over there. Basically, this is against all rules of warfare. You don't treat prisoners of war like this. Corrugated iron. James Bach documented, under other losses, the shocking truth beyond the mass deaths of disarmed German soldiers and civilians under General Eisenhower's command. Eisenhower is responsible in a few months for killing over 1.1 million German soldiers by starvation. Well, some were shot, machine gunned for trying to make it to the Rhine River uh, to get some water. They were given no water, they were given no food, they were given no accommodation, they were given no anything. And there were tents, there were huge amounts of property available, buildings where they could have put them. Nope, they didn't put them in the kind of prison camps that they put Allied prisoners in. Uh, they just left them out there to die. The Red Cross, the G Red Cross from Geneva, laid complaints. They said throughout the entire war, we've had access to every single German prison camp, every single concentration camp. Soviets never gave us access. But they were denied. The Swiss had food packages, millions of food packages, to take to prisoners of war and to Germans who were starving in that terrible winter. 1945 was one of the worst winters ever in Europe. And the Red Cross were forbidden. And they said millions died for no other reason than Eisenhower wanted them to die. In fact, his term was, we're going to castrate the German nation, kill off their manhood. And so they wanted, and they succeeded. The men they could not fe beat in battle until they outnumbered them 10 to 1. They let them die of starvation in prison camps after the war. By this time, the Morgan Thuists, that's the genocidists, and the media monopolists had decided Patton was incorrigible and must be discredited. So they began a non-stop hounding of him in the press, a la Watergate, accusing him of being soft on Nazis, and continually recalling an incident where he had slapped a shirker two years previously during a Sicilian campaign. A New York newspaper printed the completely false claim that when Patton had slapped the soldier, Kuhl, who was Jewish, he'd call him a yellow-bellied Jew. Very convenient if he had, but... He didn't happen to know that this person was a Jew when he had slapped him. That came out from the person later and made himself a victim. Then this press conference, September 22nd, reporters hatched a scheme to needle Patton into losing his temper and making statements which could be used against him. The scheme worked. Needle a soldier, easily enough. Uh, these, he had contempt for this press. The press interpreted one of Patton's answers to the insistent questions as to why he is not pressing the Nazi hunt hard enough as this Nazi thing is just like a Democrat-Republican fight. They're wanting to know why he had so many ex-Nazis in his administration of Bavaria. And he said, well, these are the engineers who run the... We've got to re repair the plumbing that's been blown up. We, these are the people with experience. And he said, they're not politicos in a sense that they're running for office. They just were members of the party, just like you'd be a member of the party of Democrats or Republicans in America. Uh, it's not a big political thing. We need the most competent people. Well, the New York Times headlined the quote, and other papers all across America picked it up. The unmistakable hatred which had been directed at him during this press conference finally opened Patton's eyes as to what was afoot. 
In his diary he wrote, there is a very apparent Semitic influence in the press. They are trying to do two things. First, implement communism, and second, see that all businessmen of German ancestry and non-Jewish antecedents are thrown out of their jobs. They have utterly lost the Anglo-Saxon concept of justice and feel that a man can be kicked out simply because somebody else says he's a Nazi. They were evidently quite shocked when I told them I would kick no one out without a successful proof of guilt before a court of law. This, by the way, is a 1942 book, Germany Must Perish. This is published in America, just read on. This is the kind of speech that was out there. Another point which the press harped on was the fact we were doing too much for the Germans, instead of the DPs, most of whom are Jews. I could not give the answer to that one, because the answer is that in my opinion, and that of most non-political officers, it's vitally necessary for us to build up Germany now as a buffer state against Russia. In fact, I'm afraid we've waited too long. In a letter on the same day to his wife, he said, I'll probably be in the headlines before you get this as the press is trying to quote me as being more interested in restoring order in Germany than in catching Nazis. Unless we restore Germany, we will ensure that communism takes America. Eyes now respond immediately to the press outcry against Patton and made his decision to relieve him of his duties. And kick him upstairs, they called it, as command of the 15th Army, which didn't exist. It was a paper army. Uh, there was no soldiers there. Nobody had ever fought there. In a letter to his wife on 29 September, he said he was not unhappy with his new assignment because I like it much better than being a sort of executioner to the best race in Europe. He then wrote a long letter to Major General Harbord, who is back in the States. In this letter, he bitterly condemned the Morgan II policy, Eisenhower's behavior in the face of Jewish commands, the strong pro-Soviet bias in the press, the politicization, corruption, degradation, and demoralization of the American army, which these things were causing. He saw the demoralization of the army as a deliberate goal of America's enemies. I've been just as furious at you at the compilation of lies which the communist and Semitic elements of a government have leveled against me and practically every other commander. In my opinion, it's a deliberate attempt to alienate the soldier vote from the commanders because the communists know the soldiers are not communistic and they fear what 11 million votes of veterans would do. They're going to vote against communism. I should not start a limited counterattack, which would be contrary to my military theories, but I should wait until I can start an all-out offensive. And here is with his friend Omar Bradley, who of course uh, behaved himself and didn't make political statements like Patton, which is why he then was made to outrank Patton. Dwight Eisenhower with some of his generals. I, I don't know, you know, uh, this Eisenhower, he wore the uniform but he wasn't a real soldier. General Omar Bradley pinning a new medal on General Patton. On the 22nd of October, he wrote a long letter back complaining about this behavior. And this Secretary of the Treasury, Henry Morgenthau, top advisor to Morgenthau, he was the author of the infamous Morgenthau plan, which he said we must wipe out the mass of Germans in st with starvation at the end of the war. Uh, he wanted Germany to be divided, uh, permanently punished, destroyed, and so on. He saw this demoralization, this avalanche of lies, as a means of trying to communize America. And so he wrote that when I finish this job, which will be around the first year, I shall resign, not retire, because if I retire, they'll have a gag in my mouth. I should not start a limited counterattack. I want to start an all out offensive. Unfortunately, his warnings went unheeded. He is quickly silenced by convenient accent, which took his life. The collision on 9th of December, 1945, occurred when a two and a half ton GMC army truck, which had been parked facing the general's car, roared into life and violently collided with the general's staff car. By suddenly and inexplicably careening directly into the opposite lane of Patton's vehicle. The actions of the truck driver seemed designed to intentionally injure or kill the general. Both the driver <coughs> of the truck and his two passengers quickly vanished. No criminal charges were ever filed. No accountability was ever recorded. The official accident reports and key witnesses went missing. That's why I started off saying, you shall know the truth and truth shall make you free. Which, by the way, is written into the ground as you enter CIA headquarters, or it used to be. I don't know if it's still there now. Despite General Patton's rank 
and fame as America's most audacious and successful combat general. There was no formal inquest, there were no official reports on the incident, and they all vanished. If a private had been involved in this accident, there would have been better reports. The military policeman who first arrived on the scene of the car accident, Lieutenant Peter Babalas, treated the accident like a fender bender. Although Patton's driver testified that the truck driver and his passengers were drunk, Sergeant Robert Thompson's blood levels were never tested. He was never charged with driving under influence. Thompson's illegal possession of a signals company truck also went unquestioned. Despite the fact he was 60 miles north of his duty station, with no apparent reason to be in Mannheim. Soldiers aren't meant to be just wandering around with a vehicle that he's not authorized to drive in the wrong place, let alone drunk. So his drunkenness, his negligence, his apparent larceny went unquestioned. Numerous investigators and authors have attempted to find the official accident reports unsuccessfully. Sergeant Robert Thompson and his two friends who were responsible for plying the truck into Patton's car were flown to England by Army Intelligence. However, just four days after the collision, Thompson mysteriously reappears in Germany where he spoke to American journalists, to the journalist Howard Smith, claiming he is alone in the truck when it struck Patton's vehicle. However, General Herbert Gay and Private Horace Woodring, the driver, swear there were two other people in the truck with Thompson. Here's Private Horace Woodring, 19-year-old son of a dairy farmer in Kentucky, grew up racing cars and flying stunt planes. Patton spoke highly of him as his trusted driver. Woodring was driving just 20 miles an hour after having just stopped at a railway crossing. Interesting. Stopped at a railway crossing. So he had to go from a station up approaching and sees his truck on the other side and then the truck. So it was waiting stationary inside and rodent life only when saw him approaching. And he drove the vehicle directly into the path of Patton's Cadillac. As there was no turning in the road in the direction he was pointing the heavy army truck, and he didn't signal before taking the action, the action seemed deliberate. Woodring testified, I was not more than 20 feet from the truck when he began to turn. Thompson made no attempt to brake, instead he accelerated directly into the general's car. General Patton was flung forward from his back seat, his head slamming violently into the steel partition behind Woodring's driver's compartment. His nose broke, he felt a sharp pain in the back of his neck. No sensation in his lower body. Instantly, George Patton knew he was paralyzed. He is the only person injured in the collision. No one else was injured in either vehicle. General Patton was paralyzed officially 9th December at 11.45. He arrived at a U.S. Army 130th Station Hospital at 12.43. They drove past several hospitals to get to this one. There's no medical staff waiting at the hospital to rush him into surgery. No team of spinal specialists assembled to deal with this life-threatening traumatic injury. Two days, later when his, two days later, when his wife, Beatrice, arrived with a spinal cord specialist to be at his side, he was horrified, the specialist, to see how they were treating him and the, the tension being put. And he said, that's exactly the wrong thing to do. He reversed a lot of the procedures. He said, uh, the treatment made no sense to the spinal specialist as to how they were treating him. And uh, then he started to recover. And the doctors were then confident the general would survive his injuries, be able to regain some mobility. he will be home for Christmas. And they were convinced he was able to travel soon. Uh, here's the smiling Robert Thompson responsible for crashing into the general's car. You know, think that he survived several wars and then dies at the hands of some drunken driver. Uh, general Patton urged his wife, get me out of this hospital, they're going to kill me here. She kind of assumed at the time that he's just being obstreperous. But later, when he did not recover, and on 21st December, his body was wheeled down to the makeshift morgue in the hospital basement, and they announced to the journalist he had uh, that General Patton had died. It made no sense. Neither his wife was prepared, neither the doctors. It was like, how did he just die? He was recovering. He's a strong man. There was no autopsy. And although Beatrice wanted him buried at West Point in America, the army insisted he must be buried at the American Military Cemetery in Luxembourg. Neither General Dwight Eisenhower nor President Harry Truman attended the military funeral for General George Patton, America's most famous and successful combat general. I mean, these are just some of his medals. It, there never was anyone in American history who assembled so many combat medals. And look at the amount of empty rows in the church. How 
on earth is a funeral for a man this important. And the war's over. The war's over by about six months. And that's the best turnout they can get. His gravesite in this Luxembourg War Cemetery, General Patton. Uh, by the way, his wife wanted to be buried next to him and army refused. So by her orders, when she died, she was cremated and her family brought ashes and sprinkled on the grave. Sad that you've got to do things like that. General Patton had made many high-ranking enemies in Moscow, Berlin, London, and Washington, D.C. His fiery determination to speak the truth made many powerful men squirm not only during the war, but after the war. His public statements praising the German army for their matchless skills as fighting men, while criticizing the Soviet Union as the real enemy of freedom, led many to see Patton as a threat to the New World Order. And, of course, to communism. The biggest mass murdering force in all of history as documented by Patrick Johnson in Operation World. Communism has killed more people uh, than all other causes in the 20th century. And the rise of communism at the end of the Second World War, as you can see, absolutely catastrophic results, leading to deaths of tens of millions of people, as documented by Ronald Reagan and Agenda. While they promised them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption. From the beginning, many did not believe Patton's death was accidental. He had already survived several remarkable accidents, including when his personal aircraft had almost been shot down by British Spitfire. I mean, how do you mistake this for a warplane? There's a whole flight of Spitfires up there. Sergeant Robert Thompson's military records were burned on the 12th of July 1973 when a fire swept through the National Personal Records Center in St. Louis, Missouri, destroying all 18 million military personnel files. And Lieutenant Babalas's accident report, the military policeman, also vanished. A 1953 request for copy of the report received the official response, noting report of investigation not on file. Casualty branch has no papers on file regarding the accident. There's no information on the accident and patents aids file. General Herbert Gay wrote his own report, and that disappeared from his personal report. Who can make all these reports disappear? If the Soviets killed him alone, without American collusion, how could they get rid of all the files, even in America? The report organized by General Godfrey Keyes, commander of the 7th Army, also went missing. In fact, the only report that remained in circulation was a document allegedly written in 1952, signed by his driver, Hudris, Horace Woodring, who, when asked about it in 1979, swore he had never made such a statement, he had never signed his name to any such report. He said the paperwork's a fabrication. When is a cover-up? What are they covering up? The vehicle on display at the Patton Museum at Fort Knox, Kentucky, has been proved to not be the vehicle that General Patton was driving on a fateful day, and the engine and chassis numbers have been scratched out. Why would you need to rub out the chassis and engine numbers? Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who justify the wicked for a bribe and take away justice from the righteous man. So who killed General Patton? There's been a number of books on this mysterious death. And the best is Target Patton. Here's his loyal dog. And, you know, to see the dog lying by his trunks. Patton must be buried in Luxembourg, December the 23rd, 1945. And so he is, with many of his men who died in the Battle of the Bulge in front. There are other memorials to him all over. But in 1979, OSS agent Major Douglas Bazata asserted that he had been part of a hit team tasked to assassinate General Patton. Now, he said this to a gathering of hundreds of Jedbas, OSS officers, from the Second World War in a CIA event in DC when he was Assistant Secretary of the Navy. Major Douglas Bazata, who is a heavily decorated war vet of the OSS, he says to his peers, and apparently they all believed him, he had fired a low velocity kinetic energy weapon, sort of like a very high powered egg air rifle, but it didn't shoot a bullet, it shot a bolt. So it looked like a bolt of a car. So if you saw a bolt of a car lying in an accident, well, a bolt could be lying around. At the base of his neck, he was 
he was positioned in the rubble of this bombed out place in Mannerheim, uh, waiting for the truck to stop him at this place. And then he would shoot the bolt at the base of his neck um, so that he would be uh, par paralyzed. That was the goal. The best way to kill someone is to make it look like an accident. And even if he doesn't die from the accident, we'll get him in the hospital. And it'll look like he died of injuries. So this is what Major Douglas Bazata said. When Patton failed to die and was showing signs of recovery, he was murdered in his hospital by Soviet NKVD ag agents who brought in with, you know, injection uh, in the hospital. Um, they had a whole range of different medical ways of making your heart stop and so on. Bazata then swore that while Bill Donovan, head of the Officer Secret Service, OSS, paid him $10,000 plus another $800 in expenses for his role in Patton's death. And of course, Bazata, who said... He had assassinated hundreds of people, but his conscience was deeply troubled over this one. Because he realized this is inexcusable. He said, you start off by assassinating bad guys. Then you assassinate people who are not that bad. And after a while, you're assassinating innocent people who just happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. And before you know it, you're assassinating your own war heroes. And he, he, he was disgusted with himself. Douglas Bazzotti left the Army as a major in 1947 had been awarded the Distinguished Service Cross, four Purple Hearts, Purple Hearts because he wounded in action, France's Cross of War with two palms, later hired for the U.S. Government Special Assistant Secretary of the Navy, served under Ronald Reagan, by the way. OSS agent Douglas Bazzotti wrote of his meeting at Claridge's Hotel in London with Wild Bill Donovan. Douglas, I do indeed have a problem. It's the extreme disobedience of General George Patton and of his very serious disregard of orders for the common cause. Shall I kill him, sir? Bazzata asked. Yes, Douglas. You do exactly what you must. And he'd been trained, make these things look like an accident, and that's what he did. Now, the interesting thing is that something this big can be kept under wraps for decades. And there's a whole lot of top leaders, military top leaders, um, who've endorsed this book, uh, Target Pattern by Robert Wilcox, which is one of the best. William Colby, a former OSS agent, went on to become head of Central Intelligence uh, Agency, praised Bazart in his 1978 book, Honorable Men. So Bazart is an extremely credible witness. And he didn't just say this to the writer. In fact, he, was, he gave all of his files to Wilcox. Uh, but um, he said this openly to all of his contemporaries who went through the war with him. Some have come to recognize General Patton as the first casualty of the Cold War. Patton's insights and convictions were considered a threat to the New World Order. We are told to hate evil, to love good, and to establish justice in the gates. Interestingly enough, Robert Orlando was advertising back in 2015 at the 70th anniversary of the murder of General Patton to bring out the book, Silence Patton, First Victim of the Cold War, sorry, film. This film was meant to be launched in 2015. We were communicating with him in 2015. And we've never been able to hear since. The, you can still see the trailer, but nothing else has happened. It's like he's disappeared and the film never came to... There's a trailer and that's it? Um, what happened? Silence Patton's been silenced. Now, there was a big film made on General Patton, uh, which was very impressive. Here's some of the quotes... We herd sheep, we drive cattle, we lead people. Lead me, follow me, or get my, out of my way. Originality. If everyone is thinking alike, somebody isn't thinking. When a man gets married, he must be just as careful to keep his wife's love as he was to get it. It would be very sad for both of them if he said to himself, now that I have you, I need not worry about losing you. Don't do that ever. Politicians are the lowest form of life on earth. Liberal Democrats are the lowest form of politicians. It seems to me that the fatalistic teachings of Muhammad and the utter degradation of women is the outstanding cause for the arrested development of the Arab. He's exactly as he was around the year 700 while we've kept on developing. <laughs> a good plan, violently executed now, is better than a perfect plan executed next week. No bastard ever won a war by dying for his country, won it by making the other poor dumb bastard die for his. <laughs> and... I saw that sign every day for about nine months. It was on a big billboard at our parade ground in 6th South African Infantry. There were patent quotes all over the place. Another one was, better to lose sweat and training than blood and battle. Except we lost blood and training as well. Uh, but this is classic pattern. 
The test of success is not what you do when you're on top. Success is how high you can bounce when you hit the bottom. Moral courage is the most valuable and usually the most absent characteristic in men. No sane man is unafraid in battle, but discipline produces in him a form of vicarious courage. Accept the challenges so that you can feel the exhilaration of victory. We promise the Europeans freedom. It would be worse than dishonorable not to see that they have it. This might mean war with the Russians, but what of it? If we have to fight them, now is the time. From now on, we will get weaker and they will get stronger. Patton was a genius of war who stands out as someone who went beyond actually knowing how to win battles tactically, but he understood it philosophically. He's a straight talker who couldn't play the political game and he paid a high price for it. This is from the filmmaker who has disappeared off the map in the last few years since saying he's bringing out this film. General Patton was a prophetic voice during crucial moments of American history, offering a warning that had otherwise been silenced. In the light of those who opposed Patton, enemies and allies alike, is it any wonder why 70 years later many still would question his untimely death? Even today his silence can be heard. This, by the way, was the prayer that he had printed and given to every man in the Third Army from his chaplain during the Battle of the Bulge. Almighty and most merciful Father, we humbly beseech thee of thy great goodness to restrain these immoderate rains with which we have had to contend. Grant us fair weather for battle. Graciously hearken to us as soldiers who call upon thee that armed with thy power we may advance from victory to victory and crush the oppression and wickedness of our enemies, and establish thy justice among men and nations. War as I knew it by General Patton. He wrote the diary, daily diary of the Third Army's advance through Europe. The Patton papers are his private correspondence and corresponds to friends, family, and other generals. There are other books on it. There's the Patton Museum, which I've been to as well. There's medals. And the M47 Patton tank. America's main battle tank, second to be named after him. Interestingly enough, if you've seen the film The Battle of the Bulge, there's no Tiger tanks in it, there's no Panther tanks in it. The Germans are driving Patton tanks because they didn't have enough German tanks around that time, so they were using the American Patton tanks for the film. Um, the Patton tank, Cold War warrior. The Patton film, George E. Scott, quite remarkable, fairly accurate. Uh, quite a bold cinema achievement, and Robert Wilcox's book, Target Pattern, absolutely must reading. Uh, a weaker one, Bill O'Reilly produced Killing Pattern, which is um, uh, fair. Whatever happened to this film, I don't know. We were looking forward to a dramatized film. But of course, it also backs up what Patrick Buchanan and Peter Padfield have put on as well. And The Secret War from Max Hastings, which works with the intelligence war and the uh, at least those papers that have been open to the um, like the Enigma codes and uh, GCHQ files and so on but this uh, as one general said in the foreword for this book the secret war requires that every single history book in the world has to be rewritten about the second world war because it completely turns on its head everything that we've been told because these are the things that were kept sealed for 70 years and now we suddenly know about a whole lot of things that, in fact, this is the problem to undo so many falsehoods that people have been led to believe. So, any questions, any comments? Patton, his life and legacy. Yes. Well, when I first heard it, from General Parton, 30 years ago, is that right, 1988, I remember just hearing us thinking, how is this possible? You know, and, and, uh, but since then I've, I've come across more than enough evidence, of course since then these books have come out and the test has come out, but an American Air Force General first told me, and it took me years to believe that could even be possible. Yes. But I mean, he was in charge of the Allies that uh, defeated Germany, so he couldn't have been a sort of stupid person. Well, he didn't say he was stupid, saying he's not a real soldier. Meaning he wasn't, he wasn't a combat soldier. 
He was an administrative political. But he was an administrative. He was an administrative man, and he he did a lot of the administration. But for example, he's a politico. And you can see he went from being general to being president of the United States. And of course, they really like this. You know, I like Ike. Remember that that's a phrase they put there. But but Eisenhower is not a nice person. He is he is a war criminal. Uh, in fact, there's one of the quotes I didn't put in here, where General Patton said, "I killed Germans in battle. Eisenhower's killing them as prisoners of war." And that's in the other losses. And and Eisenhower being an accountant he changed the, the definition in the books of german prisoners of war to defs disarmed enemy forces and instead of them dying there were other losses and it's going through these strange files that uh, the uh, jacques bach um, the canadian journalist solved the mystery when he realized the other losses were deaths and these were of defs and so they, Eisenhower was saying to the to the Red Cross, you can't have access to our prisoners of war because they're not prisoners of war, they're DEFs, they disarmed enemy forces, they're not covered by the Geneva Convention. And uh, just, which of course is against the spirit and the letter of the Geneva Convention. And he was covering it up and this is one of the biggest disgraces. You know, one thing that you find, you get a lot of soldiers, especially of Second World War, who don't want to talk about it. And you cannot understand why many wouldn't want to talk about it. There's a lot of things that it's just, how do you... My dad wouldn't even talk about it. But he would say sometimes it wasn't like that when he watched a film. And, you know, I even remember saying, I don't believe it. Don't believe what, Dad? Any of it. And, you know, watching war films, and he'd, I don't believe any of it. Well, what do you mean? Well, it wasn't like that. And then he'd say something like, Germans were an honourable enemy, a gentleman. That's somebody who spent six years in the 8th Army. That's not much. You'd like to get a bit more detail. But but uh, you take, for example, if, if anyone here has watched the um, Downson Abbey, and of course Lord Grantham and his butler fought in the South Africa War against the Boers. They never say anything about it. Well, what could they say? We burned farmhouses, rounded up poor women, children, put them in concentration camps, shot their cattle and sheep, dynamited or poisoned their wells. I mean, <clears throat> what glory is there in that? <laughs> what can you report? What did they do in the anglo -Boer War? We marched around the sun trying to catch the, the vet, and when we couldn't, we went for their farms and rounded up the women and children. That brought them to the negotiation table. That wouldn't fit into Downton Abbey, so just have, they were in the war. But what can you say about it? You can lie like Hollywood, or you can kind of ignore it. But um, I've got no problem saying what we did and saw in the South African army in Angola. And I've, I've had pictures. But I don't think we did anything dishonorable. But if you were involved in some of the sort of things like General Patton was outraged, and can you imagine after all the sacrifice, and they get there, and he looks at these bombed out houses, starving people, and he thinks, are we waging war against civilians now? And our soldiers who he fought in battle and he respected as great people. And now we've got to ship them over to the Soviets, who you know are a bunch of savages, as slaves for them? No wonder General Patton was outraged. And so it's, you can just imagine this. So he was saying he's going back to America to launch a new offensive against the real SOBs. Um, he's talking about the Washington, D.C. politicians. Um, so, no wonder they killed him, actually, when you, when you look at what he is standing for. And he, it's just as disgusting to think that they could get away with this for so long. But it's no longer possible to suppress these things because you've now got social media. It's not just Hearst and a couple of big people, Turner and so on, who run them into the ma mass media. Now, almost anybody can get their story out. The trouble is we're losing a lot of the war veterans. I mean, most of the people who were in the Second World War have died out, and there's just a few still around now. So people like Bazata, he handed over all his files, all his diaries, and he gave everything to uh, to uh, Wilcox before he um, uh, died. And so 
you have some of these people who have this pangs of conscience and think, I want to make right and I want to yeah, confess. So some of this comes out. Well, ultimately, God's going to shine a light on what we've hidden in darkness. Every secret will be brought out, yes, in time. So any other comments? Oh, you're welcome, yes. Oh, well, DPs is not our kind of terminology, uh, but uh, displaced persons is what they were calling them. So when he says displaced persons, he's talking about the people who were in the concentration camps who had been released. So they would have been Jewish or other prisoners of war. But if they're prisoners of war, Allied prisoners of war would be getting released and being sent back home. If they were Russian, they were being forced back into Soviet Union. So the people in the camps um, were Jewish, non-Russian, non-Allied soldiers. I think that's basically, and they used the word DP just to avoid using uh, uh, a word that could be construed as ethnic prejudice or anti-Semitism or something like that. So he, he used the word DPs and displaced persons, almost synonymous with Jewish people, it seems. Well, he's, he was astounded at how many millions there were. And they were displacing, and there were very few Germans who had their homes intact because most were at least damaged, and many, if not most, were destroyed, especially in the cities. But the only people who had intact houses would probably be in the countryside. And many of those were taken over. Um, I've spoken to people who were just kicked out into the snow. Um, allies took their home and and kicked them out and so on. So those things did happen. 